We'll now discuss the second phase of the compiler process, the parsing. During the parsing phase, a compiler determines whether the tokens recognized by the scanner during the first phase fit together in a grammatically meaningful way. In other words, we're basically asking ourselves, are these statements legal statements in the language? So think of this as if you were checking a, a sentence in English and making sure that it was grammatically correct. So let's use an English example just to kind of show you this process. So let's say I have the statement, the dog ate the bone. We would still do the first step, the, the scanning process to get our tokens. So in this case, uh, the word the would be an article, dog would be a noun, ate is a verb, the is an article again, and bone is a noun, and the period is punctuation. So what we can do is we can take a look at the grammar rules and try to determine if this is in fact a valid statement in the English language. So what are some grammar rules? Well, if you know any English, which I'm sure everyone does, there are a lot of grammar rules, and we're not going to go over all of them, but here's just a, a subset. So we'd say that a sentence is defined, so that's why we have sentence equals, so we, we're saying that a sentence is defined as a subject, a verb, and then an object, and then some punctuation at the end. Now we define a subject as some type of noun phrase, and an object is also defined as some noun phrase. And we're going to define a noun phrase as an article with a noun together. With these grammar rules, let's take our sentence and see if it is a valid sentence. So we have the dog ate the bone, and there is a period at the end. Hopefully you can see it. So we'll first map out the, the tokens that we had. So here were the tokens that we mentioned before. So now we can put together these tokens to form the other parts of the grammar rules that we had. So we would see here, for example, that the first article noun would be part of a noun phrase. And then we also have the other article noun over on the right, which put those, if we put those together, would also be a noun phrase. So now we can think of our sentence as noun phrase, verb, noun phrase, then punctuation. But if you remember from our grammar rules, uh, a subject can be a noun phrase, and an object can also be a noun phrase. So we can uh, say that the first noun phrase corresponds to the subject of the sentence, and the second noun phrase corresponds to the object of the sentence. So now if we apply our rule again, well, what was the definition of our sentence? Well, it was a subject, and then a verb, and then an object, and then punctuation. So sure enough, this is a valid sentence according to our grammar rules. Now let's take a look at an example where we do not have a valid sentence or an incorrect sentence. So let's say we have something like the dog ate the, and that's it. So let's try applying our grammar rules and see if we can diagram the entire sentence to see if it would actually form a sentence. Well, we first get our tokens. So we have article, noun, verb, and then article. Well, the first uh, article and noun would form the noun phrase, and then that noun phrase would turn into a subject, but now we have subject, verb, article, and we don't have anything in our current set of grammar rules that would map this to some other term in the grammar. So at this point, we would just kind of say we're, we're stuck here because there is no, uh, there's no object associated with the article or the verb, or there's no nothing that defines the combination of a subject, verb, an article. So here we would just have to conclude that the sentence is grammatically incorrect. The same thing happens with statements in a programming language. So if a compiler is able to diagram a statement, uh, maybe something such as uh, a equals b plus c, then it would conclude that the statement is structurally correct. So let's just kind of go through this and see if we can come up with a, a proper statement here. So we first get the tokens associated with it. So A is a symbol, equal sign is an equal sign, B is a symbol, the plus sign is an operator, and C is a symbol. Now we're gonna say that uh, an expression would be defined as a symbol, an operator, and then another symbol, and that an assignment statement would be defined as a symbol, an equal sign, and then some expression. So by going through this diagram, then that means that this, in fact, is a valid statement in our language. The previous diagrams that we showed are what are called parse trees. And they start from the individual tokens in the statement, and then we show how these statements can be grouped together into these predefined grammatical categories. 
So, I mean, these categories depend on the, the rules of the grammar, but we just kind of put these together. And the successful construction of a parse tree is proof that a statement is correctly formed according to the rules of the language. If a parser cannot produce such a parse tree, then the statement is not correctly formed. So in the field of compiler design, the process of diagramming a high-level language statement is called parsing. And it's done by using a program that's called a parser. So the parser is what takes care of creating these types of parse trees. So the output of a parser is either a complete parse tree or it's going to be an error message if we can't construct a parse tree. The question now is how does a parser know how to construct a parse tree? What tells it how the pieces of the language fit together? So like in the statement we did earlier, I mean, how does the parser know that the format of an assignment statement is a symbol and then an equal sign and an expression? Well, the answer is it doesn't know. We have to tell the parser that we have the, this setup. So this means that the parser must be given a formal description of the syntax or the grammatical structure of the language that we're going to uh, analyze. And the most widely used notation for representing the syntax of a programming language is called bacchus form or BNF. And this was actually named uh, after its designers, John Bacchus and Peter Nair, or Nair, I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, I think it's Nair. But anyway, we were just gonna say BNF. Um, so in BNF, the syntax of a language is specified as a set of rules, which we also call productions. And this entire collection of rules is what we call a grammar. Each individual BNF rule looks something kind of like this, where we have a left-hand side, two colons, and an equal sign, and then a definition. Now, the left-hand side of a BNF rule is the name of a single grammatical category. So this could be something like symbol or expression or assignment statement. The BNF operator, two colons and an equal sign, means is defined as, and then the definition part of it, which is also called the right-hand side, specifies the grammatical structure of the symbol that's appearing on the left-hand side of the rule. So like in this example, we would have the left-hand side is defined as whatever the definition is. Now, it's also worth noting that this definition may contain any number of objects. Uh, so for example, let's take a look at the BNF rule for an assignment statement. So we have assignment statement on the left-hand side. We have our two colons and equal sign. And then we have our definition on the right-hand side. So that's equal uh, symbols equals expression. So we can see this as assignment statement is defined as a symbol, the equal sign, and then expression. If a parser is analyzing a statement in a language and it sees exactly the same occurrence of objects that appears on the right-hand side of a BNF rule, then it's allowed to replace them with the one grammatical object on the left-hand side of the rule. So for example, let's take a look at a BNF rule for an expression. So an expression is defined as uh, a symbol, an operator, and then another symbol. So we have these three tokens. So what this means is if we encounter these three objects together, so if, if a parser encounters a symbol, an operator, and a symbol next to each other in the input, then the parser can replace them with the object appearing on the left-hand side. Or in this case, it can replace them with the uh, expression in this case. So in a sense, this is actually the same thing as having the parser constructing one branch of the parse tree. The BNF rules use two different types of objects, and these are called terminals and non-terminals that would appear on the right-hand side of a production. Terminals are the actual tokens of the language recognized and returned by the scanner. So just as an example of some of the terminals then the, the language that we've been kind of using here would be like symbol and number, equal sign, plus sign, minus, and so forth. And the important characteristic of terminals is that they're not defined any further by the other rules of the grammar. That is, there is no rule in the grammar that explains the meaning of such objects as uh, symbol and equal sign and so forth. Uh, they're just simply elements of the language, which also means that they're never going to appear on the left-hand side of a rule or a production. Because remember, the left-hand side is something that we're defining. 
we don't define these. They're just like the basic building blocks of our grammar. The second type of object used in a BNF rule is a non-terminal. Now, a non-terminal is not an actual element of the language, but instead it's an intermediate grammatical category that's used to help explain and organize the language. Uh, so just to give a couple of examples from what we've been using, expression would be a non-terminal. An assignment statement would be a non-terminal. So I mean, these categories help us understand the structure of the sentence or the statement, and they show that it's correctly formed, but they're not the actual words of the sentence that's being studied. And these statements have to be defined by the grammar. They're not the basic building blocks of the grammar. Instead, we put together the basic building blocks and give them some category, and that's what we call the non-terminal. In every grammar, there is one special non-terminal called the goal symbol. This is the final non-terminal, and it is the non-terminal object that uh, the parser is trying to produce as it builds the parse tree. So when the parser has produced the goal symbol using all the elements of the sentence or statement, it's proved the syntactical correctness of the sentence or the statement that's being analyzed. So like in our assignment statement example, uh, the goal symbol was actually just assignment statement. So when this non-terminal goal symbol has been produced, the parser has finished building the tree and the statement has been successfully parsed. Uh, the collection of all these statements can then be successfully parsed. Uh, th these collection of statements is what we call the language that's defined by the grammar. There are some additional symbols that are used in BNF rules. And these are what we call meta symbols. So I mean, they're used to help describe the language. So a couple of examples would be like the the angle brackets and then the two columns equal sign. So like we use the angle brackets to help show non-terminals. Now they're also used to help with some terminals, um, but they don't represent actual characters of the language, but rather groups of characters that are constructed by the scanner. But the whole point here is that we use these symbols to uh, help describe the characteristics of a particular language. Now, in addition to these particular symbols, there are two other meta symbols that are used in BNF definitions. So one of them is the vertical bar, which means or, and it's used to separate two alternative definitions of a non-terminal. Uh, and I mean, this could be done without a vertical bar, but by writing two separate statements, but it's sometimes more convenient to use the vertical bar. Uh, so for example, uh, we could define an operator as a non-terminal and define it as a plus sign or a minus sign or the multiplication sign or the division sign. We can write four different rules for this, but this just makes it a little bit more compact. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, it just makes it a lot easier to, to read and understand instead of having like a rule for each line. Um, there is a second meta symbol that's used in BNF definitions, and that is the Greek letter lambda. And this represents the null string which just means the empty string or just nothing at all. So I mean, it is possible that a non-terminal can be empty and the symbol lambda is used to indicate this. Uh, so like, for example, if maybe we're trying to uh, define a signed integer or at least the sign portion of the integer. So we can define sign as a non-terminal, which can be a plus sign or a minus sign, or it can just be nothing. Sometimes we just use nothing to represent a positive number, so we can use lambda whenever we want to represent this nothingness.